Well, good morning. You know, what I've been trying to do more and more is seek the Lord for, for a word. Now, let me tell you why. Uh, I believe that we serve a personal God. Uh, we don't have a generic God. We have a God that, that knows each and every one of us by name. Can you say amen to that? He knows your name, and it's important, amen? And so with that in mind, the Lord just uh, gave me a word. There, there's someone here in your relationship. This is not a marriage relationship. You're in a relationship with someone. And listen to me. It started out good, and it all seemed good, seemed like the right thing. It was headed towards marriage. It's going to be all good. But all of a sudden now, there's this individual is exhibiting some things that, that uh, you're, you're beginning to question. And, and, but in your mind, you're saying this, it's okay, it's okay. And you're, you're kind of just pushing, kicking the can down the road, so to speak. And I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, I'm speaking to you from the heart, not the head. Listen to my still, small voice. And here's the word of the Lord for whoever you are here. Maybe you're online or you're here. You need to cut that guy loose. All right. I don't say that lightly. I'm just telling you, you need to cut that guy loose. He is not your choice that God has for you. He's got better. Amen. So I just encourage you with that. Another person here that is dealing with a health uh, crisis, you've had a medical report and here's what you've done. You've taken the medical report and here's what you're saying. Okay, God, you've got this. And basically you're not doing anything about treatment or anything. And I hear the spirit of the Lord saying to me, did I tell you to do that? Did I direct you to do that by my spirit? And here's the thing. If you haven't heard God specifically tell you to do that, you need to do everything in your power to do all the stuff you need to do. The Bible says this, having done all, stand. So that means you need to do what the doctors are telling you, do all that stuff, but you're still trusting Jesus. Let me tell you something. The doctors are not the enemy, okay? They're hands and tools that God can use as well. Amen. So if you're that person, do not let, and here, here's what the Lord's saying to me. You're doing this not because you want to trust Jesus. It's actually because you're afraid to go back to the doctor. And God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love power and of a sound mind and so do not let the spirit of fear hold you back from getting the treatment that you need amen all right so i just leave you with that so and you did all well you just looked at me pretending you know just keep looking at me nobody knows it's you and uh, you know you, you can work it all out with jesus and, and what do i mean by that here's the thing you know christianity is a religion but it's more than that christianity at its core is a personal relationship with a person Christianity is about a person. The gospel is about a person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And God has allowed us, this is amazing, not to just know about God, but to know God through his son in a personal way. That's, there's no other religion like it, all right? And so, listen, uh, there's only one way unto the Father, and that is through the Son. There's only one way, all right? And uh, we're going to hear a little bit about that as, as time goes on here today. But uh, last, uh, not last week, but the week before, we started a series called Got Questions. Was, were some people here for that? And we started. And by the way, in case I forget, because I forgot at the second service, if you still got questions, uh, we're still going to be doing this at least one more week. So there's cards in the back. You got a question, write it down. Put it in the uh, tithes and offerings box. And it's possible your question may get answered right up here. Amen. Again, please no trick questions. Be serious about your questions. You know, over the years, we did this back in 2019, and we got those, those uh, you know, ones to try to twist us up. I don't want, I just want honest questions, all right? So please, uh, you know, honor the Lord with that. You're in church, so let, let's do the right thing. Amen. Well, let's see what God's Word has to say about asking questions. James, in uh, chapter 1, verse 5, he says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. How many people were a little kid at one time? Hopefully all of you are going to put up your hands, all right? You're all a little kid at one time. And you're maybe asking your parents, and maybe you were that chatty, catty kind of person, and you were always asking questions to your parents, and somewhere along the way they went, shh. You know, they basically, maybe you were in a public place, maybe you were in church, or maybe in a library or someplace, you, you, and you had that loud little voice, that loud little squeaky voice, and your parent just basically was telling you to do what? Shut up, right? You know, shh. You know, and, and how many people have had that happen? My hand's up, right? And after they shh you enough, after a while, you're like, I guess I'm just not going to ask my questions anymore. And I want to tell you something based on this scripture. God will never shush you. 
He will never shush you. Every question you've got, if it's important to you, is important to him, all right? He won't mock you. He won't laugh at you. In fact, Scripture says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, what does that mean? If you haven't got all the answers, is there anyone here has all the answers? Well, good. You did a lot better than the first group. First service. I, I give them credit. Maybe they weren't all quite awake, all right? You know, some of them, you know, maybe they thought it was a trick question or something. But the bottom line is, yeah, pop that Scripture back up. The bottom line is that it... You don't believe that you have all the answers, then you'll ask questions. But if you think you've got all the answers, you won't ask. And so this is like a prerequisite. We need to come with the humility of heart into this world, understanding we haven't got it all figured out. I, how many people would like to have it all figured out? Sure, we do. But here's the thing. The way we can find out things is to talk to God about it. And so it says this. You lack wisdom. In other words, you haven't got all the answers. You'll ask questions, all right? And God will generously give to all without finding fault. He won't mock you. He won't tell you, that's a stupid question. You know, what's that? He'll never do that. If you have a serious, honest question, he wants to answer it. And it will be what? Given to you. Now, I can't promise you you're going to get the answer sent to you in a sealed mailed envelope with uh, thus saith the Lord, uh, you know, in your mailbox with an exact answer. But I will tell you this, God will answer your question. Maybe through a friend, maybe through a fellow believer, maybe through the word, maybe by the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit on the inside, but you will hear from him. And oh, by the way, wait is an answer. All right, I know that when parents say, we'll see, you know what that means, right? What are they really saying when a parent says, we'll see? They're saying no, right? They're kicking the can down the road, hoping you'll forget. And, and so when God says wait, he's not that way. It could be that the circumstances aren't ready for the answer. Could be you're not ready for the answer yet. But regardless of that, if he says wait, you need to have the patience to wait. He is faithful. You know, back to that individual that, that needs to kick that guy to the curb. If you will be patient, God will send the right man into your life, whoever that is, all right? God is faithful. He knows everything. He's a lot smarter. He's way above us. You know what I'm saying? Amen. Okay, so I give you that as a base to say that we need to ask questions. So with that, I've got a couple of questions that you guys have actually sent in. Some of them are combining a couple of questions together because they're very similar, and, so, and some are just individual separate questions, all right? So let's dive into this. Some of you may know the answers already to some of these, or maybe all of them, but let me ask you this. Do you know where the scriptural support is for your answer? You see, you don't want someone to ask you a question, especially about God's stuff, and say, well, I think, or I believe. Listen to me. It's not about what you think or what you believe. It's God's word says. God watches over his word to see that it performs that which he was sent out to do. God doesn't watch over you and me as far as our words, but it's his word in us and through us. Amen? And so I want God's answers to these questions. Uh, I'll tell you this, that as I've grown in the Lord, some of my answers have changed to some of these questions. Why? Because I've come to a greater wisdom and understanding of what the Word says. And I hope all of us are growing that way. In fact, some of these in the last 10, 15 years, I've, I've just, you know, adjusted my answer a little bit because it's not what I think, it's what God thinks. Amen? And there is an answer to every question in God's Word. So let's start with one of these, all right? So here it is. If God is good and caring and loving and forgiving, then how could He make a place called hell that will be a place of torment for all who go there. How many people have either thought that question in some form or have been asked that question in some form? That's a, that's a hard question to answer, right? They're like, well, if you preach that, you know, God's such a loving, caring God, why did he make hell? God loves everyone. Why don't we just have, you know, a lovey-dovey party and everyone be nice to each other? And everybody goes to heaven. Well, here's the thing. There is an answer in Scripture that tells us some facts about this. So let's look at the first one, and it's in Matthew. And Jesus is, is telling a parable. And in this, he's talking about sheep and goats and, and the end times and how they're going to be divided up in judgment. All right, so here, here's what he says, all right? And so Matthew 25, verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, or demons, because they're fallen angels. So look at this. First question I ask is this, what was hell prepared for? What's it say? The devil and his fallen angels and demons. Was hell made for humans in the first place? 
No, it wasn't. And so you need to understand that God's heart is for every human to go to heaven, all right? Not hell. So his initial plan for hell was for the devil, for Satan, and his angelic fallen angels, all right? And, which are called demons. Now, why? They're unredeemable. In other words, they can't come back to God once they've turned away. And so that was what hell was originally designed for. That's what our loving God has done. Why? To separate them from the good people, to separate them from, from all that is good and righteous and light, right? Because you don't want that all mixed in. Look at how this world's working right now. You know, we've got light and we've got darkness. How's it working out for everybody? Not good, right? So there's a day coming where sheep and goats are going to be divided. For those that are righteous and following God will go to one place. And what happens to the others? They go to a different place. So I didn't fully answer the question, though, have I? All right? Because we do know if we read Scripture that there are humans that do go to hell. And so let's go on and, and look at God's Word. Uh, 2 Peter 3.9. Let's just have a look at this. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises. Some consider slowness. Rather, He is patient towards you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So here's the thing. God's heart's for everyone to be saved, right? That's what the Scripture says. So then the question is, if that's God's heart, He's all-knowing, all-powerful, can do anything He wants, then why isn't everyone saved? And it comes down to two simple words, free will. In other words, God created mankind, men and women, in his image and his likeness. And in doing so, we're different from everything else in creation. He made us with a free will. We can choose to follow him or we can choose to reject him. So as you look at this scripture, it says he's not slow in keeping his promise. The context of 2 Peter is, man, he's talking about it all hitting the fan. Right. He's talking about, you know, all hell breaking loose, and, you know, the end times, it's bad, you know, all the different things that are going to happen, judgment and things, but oh, no, put the scripture back up, but, but in the midst of it, he says this, look, he's not slow, in other words, it's not that he's delaying, but he's hoping and believing that as many as possible will change their hearts and turn to him. So that's why he's waiting, all right? That's why he hasn't pronounced judgment on the earth and, and all things have you know, gone crazy. Why he's waiting for those that maybe are in wars right now. You've got you know, Ukraine and, and Russia. You've got what's going on in, in Palestine. You've got people in foxholes, literally in foxholes. And maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking to them right at this very moment, saying, you need to get right with me. And right at this very moment in time, they're looking up among the smoke and the ashes and the flying bullets, saying, God, I need you. Please come into my heart right now. Well, why does God allow that to happen? He's patient and long-suffering that as many as possible will come into the kingdom. In fact, I'm glad God waited the first 20 years of my life. They didn't kick me to the curb. You know what I'm saying? That, that literally he waited that long. So don't we want God to be patient? We do, amen? And that, that's the premise here. And then he goes on, rather being patient towards us, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. That word repentance means the change of mind, change of heart, change of direction, amen? That's God's heart. But again, he can't make anyone change. You ever tried to make somebody change? How'd it work out? Not good. Yeah, it, it doesn't work. You know, you can, you can try, you can try and maybe somebody might modify their behavior a little bit, but unless it happens on the inside of them, they're gonna go back to their same old habits, same old ways of doing things. They might do it for a little while to please you, but in the end, they're gonna go back to where they are or where they were unless the change happens on the inside. And only Jesus can make that change, amen? And so, God did not, so just bring that question to a conclusion, God did not make hell for people originally. His heart is for everyone to be saved. And God gives that opportunity for all of creation. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. There's, there's no one God leaves out, but the thing is, you have a free will to choose. So does God send people to hell? No, they send themselves there. God's heart is for them to go to heaven, amen? So again, these scriptures just support what we're saying. Okay, let's move on to the next question, which is sort of connected, all right? So here's the second one. The Bible says that you must accept Jesus to be saved, Can it, right? Okay. So over the past centuries, the gospel has not been preached to every part of the earth. Does that mean that all those people who went to hell just because of being in the wrong geographical location? That doesn't seem fair. You know, think of some island in the South Pacific somewhere, right, that no missionaries have been to, and, and you're living there, and, and you're trying to do the right thing, trying to live life right, trying to treat people right, and you die, and like, you go to hell. Does that fit the narrative of the scriptures? Does that fit the narrative of the character of God? 
And yet here's the thing, we have to be careful. We can't contradict God's word of the need of a savior. You get what I'm saying? God can't just do a wink and a nod and say, well, it's okay, you, you didn't know, it's okay. No, there, there is a process in this. And do you know what that is? So how do you give an answer? Anyone had that question asked? You know, what about all those people? I, I have a lot of times. And, and a lot of times those people are, they're, they're professional challengers, right? You know, they, they know the kind of questions to ask. But you want to have an answer. Guess what? The Word of God has an answer in one wonderful place. It's in Romans. And so Romans chapter 1, here it is. Just a couple of verses. Romans 1 verse 18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful and evil men or people who push away the truth from them. For the truth about God is known to them instinctively. God has put this knowledge in their hearts. Since earliest times, mankind or men, you know, men and women again, have seen the earth and sky and all God made and have known of his existence and great eternal power. So they have no excuse when they stand before God at judgment day. There it is. It can't get much clearer, right? So in other words, that there will be none without excuse. So that means that somehow they understood that there's a creator. Well, all of creation cries out there's a creator. Have a look outside. You know what I'm saying? You see the birds flying around. You see the sky. You see the planets at night. You see the, the stars. You see the moon. You see all of the animals and the grass growing. You know, you, you got to believe that somebody made this. Somebody put this thing together. This is no accident. I know the world would like to tell you, but listen to me. Complicated doesn't come from simple, okay? Anybody that tells you that from one amoeba cell, some amino acids in some swamp somewhere became a human being, they're the stupidest people on the face of the earth. I don't care how many letters are after their name or before their name, they haven't got a clue, all right? I'm just telling you because it goes against everything basic science tells you. If you have a complex thing, you take a banana and you put it on a table. What happens after a couple of weeks to that banana? Well, it's good maybe for a while. Then what happens? It becomes a pile of mush. And, and left long enough, it's all gone, right? And that's the same with us. If you have complex things, what happens is given over time, they break down back into their basic elements. So that means you had to have a creator to make things complex, okay? That's real science. Junk science says it goes the other way. It cannot go that way, all right? So we, we need to believe, you know, the truth of God's word. And so... All the creation cries out. So how does this work then? Let's go back to that Pacific Island. You got that guy there or that girl that's there. And so one day, one night they look up and they see all the stars and, and, and everything. They're like, man, you know, look at all this. Somebody must have made this. I got no idea who it is, but somebody must have made it. And then somewhere along the way in their heart, they realize, well, if, if this God that made all this is that big and can do all that, man, who am I? You know, I'm not right with that creator. I, I, need, I need help. Do you know what that person just prayed? A sinner's prayer. They didn't know the name of Jesus. They didn't know the triune nature of God, but they recognized that there was a creator and they needed help. Well, guess what? That person dies and they get to the pearly gates and they're not going to greet Peter. I know that every joke starts with Peter at the gate. Listen, Peter hasn't got some special thing at the gate, all right? Do you know who they're going to meet at the gate? Jesus. And Jesus is going to come up to him and say, hello. And the other person is going to say, hello. And uh, the person is going to say, what is this place? And Jesus is going to explain what it, it's heaven and, and, and it's a good place. And, and then Jesus is going to say, you know that person that you needed help, needed to help? I'm that person. And all of a sudden that person's like, oh, that's awesome. You see, you're accountable for what you know. So I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, well, look, it. if God's got all this figured out, then I don't need to share my faith. I don't need to do anything because he, he's going to save everybody. No, that's not how it works. You see, you're accountable for what you know. So now that you know that Jesus is the Savior, now that you know the fullness of the gospel, you are accountable to that gospel. All right, And the same with everyone else as the gospel has gone forth around the earth now and people know that it's by the name of Jesus that you're saved. They're accountable to that name. And so that's, that's how it works. So, does that mean that this is what it means? It means that every single person that's ever been born or ever will be born will have an opportunity to be saved because that's the nature and character of God. Having said that, that doesn't negate our job to share our faith and be a light to those around us. Amen? Everyone good with that? Yeah, I've had been asked that question. In my earlier days, I kind of shrugged my shoulders and said, well, I guess I go to hell. You know, I... 
That, that was kind of my answer until I realized what the Word of God very clearly says. Amen. Okay, next question. <laughs> Can Satan or the devil read my mind? I swear, sometimes he can. You know what I'm saying? But let's just look at this. First of all, let's talk about what God can do first. So let's kind of put Satan aside for a minute. I don't like talking about him anyways. And let's lift up what God can do. And this, this is important. Psalms 139 verse 4 says this. Lord, even before I say a word, you already know it. So can God read your mind? Yes, he can. In fact, before it's even formulated in your mind, he knows what you're going to think. Now, that's crazy, right? Like, he knows what you're going to think 10 years from now on this day. Like, what? How, how can you do that? Because he doesn't live in our time. God lives in the past, the present, and the future at the same time. And so that's why when he has an answer for your question or when he directs you to do something, he's got all the angles figured out. Listen, he's better than Dr. Strange. You know what I'm saying? If you guys are followers of the Marvel thing, right, where he can go and calculate all the different variations. That, listen, he's got nothing over God, all right? God's got it in an instant, got it all figured out. And so are we willing to allow him to do that in our lives? And so he, before you even think it, he knows what you're going to think. Having said that, this is not an excuse then, well, if God knows what I'm going to think, I might as well do what I want to do. No. Come on now. You're trying to outthink God, and can you do that? No. All right. You need to do what's right as the Holy Spirit directs you, and God will help you. Okay, another scripture to support this. In the New Testament, uh, Jesus was uh, helping a, a person who was a, a paralytic, and he, he says, he starts out the conversation by saying, son, your sins are forgiven. He doesn't heal the person. He just says, your sins are forgiven. And all the Pharisees around start freaking out in their heads. They're like, who's this guy blaspheming God? You know, who does he think he is? And Jesus responds to that in Matthew 9, verse 4. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? So Jesus called them on it. He knew exactly what they were thinking. And oh, by the way, when you read the story after, he says, just to prove that I am the Son of Man, I say get up in the name of Jesus. And so the guy gets healed as well. Amen? And so here's Jesus knowing everything. And we know there's other accounts as well. Nathaniel, when he was under the tree, God said, you know, Jesus said, hey, I knew you before you were here and this is what you're thinking. The point is God knows it all. Okay, so how does this compare to Satan? Well, Satan, like us, has been created by God. So he's a created being. All right, so all of a sudden now, he has limitations. He is powerful, there's no doubt about it, but he can't be everywhere at the same time like God can be, all right? He, he, can't, he, can't, he can't read your mind. And you'd like to think so. In fact, let's just ask this question. So can Satan read your mind? What's the answer? No, he cannot. But, and so let's talk about this. He can't. Why? There's no biblical evidence of it. Nowhere in Scripture does it show anywhere where the devil could read a person's mind. All right, nowhere. All right. The second thing is only God is omniscient. And that's just a fancy word to mean he's everywhere at the same time and he's all knowing. All right. And so then here's the final point. Satan, though, is very cunning. So, yeah, you want to bring that up, guys? The, those last three points bring up the last. Yep, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. One more. There we go. Satan is cunning. Though he can't read our minds, he's a skilled observer. Now, you'd swear he reads your mind, right? But he's been watching, maybe not him directly. I remember having people over the years come up and say, you know, Satan's doing this to me and Satan's doing that. And I'm like, I think he's above your pay grade and mine. He's probably not Satan himself. But maybe one of his demons, one of his underlings is, is there. And the thing is, they are observers. They observe you and watch you. And often they can anticipate your next move just by what you're doing. You know, you're alone in the house and you turn the computer on, turn the internet on. What, what might the devil do to you? What might the enemy start throwing at you? Hey, nobody's around. Why don't you go over here or go do this? Well, he's not reading your mind. He just knows your habit patterns. You know, he can just follow because of the past. And so that's why it's so important for you to realize he can throw a thought at you, but he can't read your mind. So you need to twist up the enemy as he tries to do things in your life by making a decision to do what God wants to do. Novel thought, right? Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So I'm not here to scare any of you here about the devil. He's powerful. His underlings, the demons, they're powerful, but not as powerful as the Holy Spirit that lives in you. The one in you is greater than the one that's in the world. But you need to be wary of him. Because here's the thing. 
The devil can't take your salvation from you. He can't kill you. He can't do anything to you. But here's the thing. He can do things to you to render you ineffective for him, for Jesus. Now, I don't know about you. Do you want to be a useless soul? Anybody here want to be a useless soul? I hope not. And that's what the devil wants to turn you into. So here's the thing. As we follow Jesus, we can be useful to the kingdom. Amen? Okay? So can Satan read your mind? No. But be aware of him. All right? Okay. Here's, here's our final question for today. I feel so guilty when I sometimes do something wrong. Can a believer lose their salvation? No. So we've got people on both sides of the fence. We've got theologians, big name theologians that love God on both sides of the fence and can use scripture and argue both ways. And, and I've been over the years kind of, you know, vacillate kind of between the two th- camps a little bit. I'm going to leave with you some thoughts for this. I'm not here to make you think like I'm thinking. I'm here to share the scriptures and encourage you in your personal walk with God, all right? And so with that in mind, I ask you a question. So, how did you become saved in the first place? Did you earn your salvation? Did you deserve your salvation? Did you somehow uh, work for it, pay money for it? Nope, nope, nope. All knows. So let's look at what the scripture has to say. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's what? A gift of God. Not by what? Works. So that no one can boast. So here it is. Scripture very clearly saying it's a free gift from God. So how did you get it? You asked for it. Right? You said, Jesus, come into my heart. Somewhere along the way you said, Jesus, I need you. Please, come into my heart. And what happened? A free gift. The Holy Spirit was given to you to come and dwell on the inside. And you said yes to Jesus. So did you earn it? Did you deserve it? Did you work for it? No, you asked for it. And that's why the whole world isn't saved, right? Even though it's a free gift, you still have to ask for it and receive it by faith, all right? And so that, that, there you go. So free, given to you. Okay, now I'm going to just throw this out. Even though something's free, could you give it back? If I give you a gift, if Brian, if I gave you a gift, and you looked at it and said, okay, that, yeah, that's nice. And then a day later, could you come back and say, I really don't want this, and throw it back at me? You could, right? Is it possible that salvation could be the same? Is it possible? Just a thought. So let's just move on for a minute, then we'll bring all this together, okay? So let's look at another verse, John 10, verses 27 and 28. It says this, Jesus is speaking. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that a great scripture? Doesn't that give you, a, you know, a salvation security? You know, the idea that look, no one or no thing can snatch me, you, from the Father's hand. Isn't that good to know? So in other words, if, if that was the only scripture we had, we might come to the conclusion, well, look at, you know, you can't lose your salvation. But that's not what that scripture is saying. That scripture is saying that no one or no thing can snatch you from the Father's hand. But here's a question I have. Could I remove myself from the Father's hand if I wanted to? See, it goes back to those two words that we talked about earlier, free will. Did you ever lose your free will when you accepted Jesus? No, you have free will. Now, here's the thing. Who in their right mind would want to reject the gift once they've experienced the goodness of God? I've never met anyone, all right? Now, but I have met people that have become what I term and many other people term backslidden. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's define this a little bit. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's a contract that happens in that Jesus' blood was shed so that you could become one of his children. So literally, there was an adoption paper drawn up. Literally. And in heaven, your name gets written in a book, and it says, so-and-so, put your name in, is a child of God. And there it is. It's in the book. All right? And so, you've got a copy of it, and it's in your heart. All right? It's right here. All right? You accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and and you've been adopted. So there's that free gift that's on the inside. Now, what can happen, though, 
Life happens, maybe some disappointments, maybe some of the questions you've asked didn't get answered the way you wanted them, maybe you got angry at God, all those kinds of things. And somewhere along the way, you just basically kind of rejected the adoption papers, all right? And you just said, I, I, I just don't want this anymore. Could you do that? So here's the thing, though. Even though you may have lost your papers, God's got the original. It's in his book in heaven. Your name is still there. My point being that you can't lose your salvation like a, like a set of keys. You can't lose your salvation because you did something wrong. Because remember, you didn't earn it or deserve it in the first place. And so, so many times when people backslide, they think they need to get saved again. You can't become born again, born again. All right? You become born again once. You accept Jesus into your heart. Now, again, you can become backslidden where, where again, you reject, you know, God's plan for your life maybe, God's promises, but does that mean you're unsaved? No. Now, can you become unsaved? Let me give you the definition of a person who's saved becomes unsaved. This is where the line is in my mind. The scripture talks about this, that if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, then you've rejected God. So if at some point you say, not only do I uh, don't like God, but I reject what he did on the cross for me. Now you do that, you've crossed the line. You get what I'm saying? But I know no one. I've, I've met thousands, tens of thousands of people. I've never met anyone that once they've experienced God's love and goodness and forgiveness, that they've said no and rejected him entirely. But can you? And the answer is yes. Can you? But I don't know anybody. And I don't think there's anyone here like that either. Now there may be some people here in a backslidden condition where you've walked away from what God has for you, the best for your life, but does that mean you're unsaved? I had the question asked between services, well, what if you have a person who accepts Jesus, they're in a backslidden condition, and then they die, right? Does that mean they go to hell? Well, did you earn or deserve your salvation? It's back to that again. You know, do you get to those pearly gates and Jesus says, oh man, you were on a tear this last week and pff, sorry. That's, that's just not gonna happen. But here's what I will tell you, that when you've had a change of heart where Jesus has become real to you, you don't want to sin anymore. Doesn't mean you don't sin, but you don't want to. There's a part in you that wants to go God's way. Let me tell you something. That's the part you want to follow. That's the way you want to go and grow in the Lord. Amen? Everyone with me with this? So hopefully that's brought some clarity. So, so can you lose your salvation? You can't lose it like a set of keys, all right? But could you reject Jesus? The answer is yes. But it's really, really next to impossible. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Now just before I close... You know, it's no accident that I saved the last question till last. Um, I pray that everyone within the sound of my voice, whether you're watching online or you're here, that you know Jesus in a personal way. So I want to speak to two specific groups here. One group is you never asked Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior. There's also another group here where you have somewhere along the way, you accepted Jesus. You can maybe remember the time or the place, but you've gotten off the rails and you just you've backslidden you've just gone and done your own thing and you'd like to come back to him so just if that's you in any of those two groups I just ask you to slip your hand up in the air just so I can see it and it's to acknowledge to the Lord as well I see those hands right here up front I see over on my left anyone else just want to make sure I see over, over on my right there and there at the back I see those hands so listen let's pray together here and for those that raise your hands make this your prayer so I just ask everyone to just repeat after me Dear Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I need you, that I can't have eternal life without you. Please come into my heart as Lord and Savior. I commit my life to you. I repent from my old ways. And I now turn to you. I ask for strength to overcome old ways and follow the new way which is you thank you for saving me once and for all in Jesus name amen